Hey everybody, welcome to the Find and Follow podcast where we help you find and follow Jesus in your everyday life. We've got a great episode today from the vault with our guest, Paul MacArthur. He's a friend of mine from college. He's a pastor in a small community outside of Spokane. And he shares his story about finding Jesus and uh, some cool stuff about how he's been able to minister to people and share Jesus with people in local bars and what their church has been doing about it. He shares his personal journey of losing his dad to alcoholism uh, and just how God has been able to use that in some positive ways. So it's a fantastic story. It's a great encouragement to step out of your comfort zone in what you think it means to follow Jesus, not get too wrapped around the axle and what other people think, but to join Jesus in the work that he's doing. So let's join in as Paul shares his story. Paul is here. You're a friend. We've known each other for a long time. We have. We, we went to college together. Yes. Which was a few years ago. It, it was. It you was and your just wife, a few. Amy, uh, yeah. we all went to the school together at Northwest University. We actually lived on the same floor together for a year. Do you remember that? Or did you black it out? Uh, I think you did. I did black it out. Yeah. What yeah. do you mean we lived on the same? On the 400 Fi- floor? 500 floor, buddy. You were on the 500 floor? Right across the, the hallway from you. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm dead serious. I thought you were always on the 200. No, 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 no. no. Oh, my goodness. For the early years, and then I decided to come over to and be a duck for a year. Really? And then I ditched you guys. See, that's probably why I blocked you out. Yeah. The ditching part. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. I did not know that. Who was your roommate? Eric Hall. No, he wasn't. Oh, yeah. E-Hall. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. Yes. Now Now it's ringing a bell. Now I do. There it is. Man, maybe Eric Hall would tune into this episode. He he might. (laughs) He might, Mr. Philosophy major. Right? Oh, my goodness. Actually, right. Dr. Hall now. That's, yes. I have not kept in touch with Eric, but yeah. Yeah. So anyways, Paul, you're a pastor. Uh, you are in Elmira, Washington. I am. Elmira out in Lincoln County. People are like Middle of nowhere. Googling that. They're like, I've never even heard of that. Is down that the real? Highway 2 corridor. Right? If you've been down Highway 2, you go like... Reardon, Davenport. A lot of folks have been out that far. Yeah, mm-hmm. They didn't know there was stuff after that. I know. You just got to keep going. They didn't know yeah, Creston, about, yeah, Wilbur. Highway 2, about every 10 or 15 miles, yeah. there's a wide spot in the road. <laughs> that's exactly that, it. That's what it is. With and some they, grain elevators. It, yeah, and some grain elevators. And yep. they call it a town. And then the road continues. And then there's another wide spot. That's, that's exactly it. Reardon, Davenport. And so how many Creston. people are in Elmira? So we have, uh, so in town and then also outside of town, 200 and, about 250 people. Do you guys segregate it like that? The oh, yeah. in-towners, the out-of-towners? Oh, yeah, definitely. Is there a different... Because out-of-towners, you're a farmer, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. So you got, the, you got the farmers that live on the North Ridge, and they're kind of the, the up-to-duty people. They're, they're the ones that they kind of live in their own world up there. Then you got the in-town people that, you know, they might work for a farm company or whatever or work for the, the dam, the Grand Coulee Dam, and, or own a small business. And gotcha. then you got those that are south of town that are, that's a little more of the ghetto version, if you will. Am I allowed to say that on this podcast? I don't know. But you're, it's you're, your you're town. Talking with us. You're not talking <laughs> it's about your it. people. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. So, like, that, and that's always curious to me, and I want to dive into that today, too, <laughs> okay. is people are hearing that, like, a town of 250, which is the whole, like, region, right? You guys are spread out oh. by miles. Oh, yeah. Ten, oh, yeah. 10, 20 miles, probably, the Elmira. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. But yet, there's still all these sub communities and yep. just I, w- w- I'm just always curious about that we're always drawn to smaller groups and like people would be like I could never live in a town of like 200 that's ridiculous it's so small but yet we're always still drawn in community to even smaller groups yeah. and smaller groups um, I don't know it's just it, always curious to me how God designed <laughs> us uh, and you guys are close if people are googling it you're what 30 minutes from Grand Coulee Grand Coulee yeah. Dam we're, so we're like 30 minutes uh, south of Grand Coulee so have you and ever been out real- that way oh go ahead I'm just going to help people reference. Like, mm-hmm. If you've never <laughs> been to Grand Coulee Dam, you got to get out there. Get the laser light show this summer. It's a fun oh. spot to tour and check out. It's pretty big time out there, I'll yeah. tell you what. It transformed all of central Washington. There's a lot of cool history there. You're uh, real close to Coulee City and Heartline. Yes. And, and um, some of the other communities there. So you're actually drawing from a larger population base than just the 250 people whose zip code is... Is Elmira? Yeah. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Heartline, you know, is a major metropolis of 150. <laughs> so we got <laughs> you that. You put together ACH. You got 
man. You, oh yeah, they, I mean, Cooley they, City's the the big one. Well, in Wilbur too. I mean, you're familiar with Wilbur. Yep. And so Wilbur's like six seven hundred. Cooley City's like six seven hundred. So yeah, the Wildcats. The booming. They're yeah, big. we draw from mostly like Wilbur and Heartline and then Elmira. Those those three towns are are where our Elmira campus is uh, draws from. Yeah. So we we lived in Wilbur, which is one town over, 13 miles, 12 miles? Yeah, about that. Yeah. Uh, 82 to 86. -ish, Correct. Right? Yep. So 82 to 86. And then the population of Wilbur was about 1,000. Oh, wow. Big time. Yeah, it was 1,100 in the wow. 80 census. Man. And then it continued to shrink. Yeah. You, said, you said that with such pride, Craig. <laughs> you really did. That was beautiful. You know, the big town of 11. Because <laughs> Craig's from L.A., so like he had to, he had oh, to feel man. real good oh, actually, going to a actually, little bit of a change. Actually, I, I don't say that with pride. <laughs> I just remember the 1100 because yeah. when I was receiving the call, we were living in Bellingham, and I got the call about the church in Wilbur, and uh, Cindy knew it was one of those calls because we'd kind of been looking. And so she was paying real close attention to, to what I was saying on my end. And I was making notes and I wrote down 1100 and she thought, oh, no, is that the monthly salary? We, oh. we, we have more than that right now coming in and we barely can make it. Oh. oh, no. And then she thought, oh, is that the size of the church? We've only got 100. I don't know if we can handle 1100 people. <laughs> When I got off the phone and explained to her that was the population of the town, she said, oh, that's out. We're not Shocked. going there. <laughs> <Shocked>. <laughs> oh. Because even Bellingham at 50,000 at the time mm -hmm. was culture shock for us. Because wow. L.A. and San Diego are where we each grew up and met in San Diego. And so Bellingham was small town living for us. Yeah. Wilbur is just like, forget it, right? It's a whole different world. Yeah. yeah. It's different. And it was a metropolis compared to Elmira even at that time. Absolutely. It still is. Well, Paul, I didn't say this, but thanks for being on the podcast and driving all the way in hey. to be in person from Elmira. My pleasure. Listen, we when you live in Elmira, it. you got to drive an hour and a half everywhere. So <laughs> coming to Spokane's no big deal. Yeah. You probably got a few other things to do today. Or oh, yeah. Pick up. Oh, yeah. 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 When you make your trip to the you, big city, you, you got to take advantage of it. That's right. Yep. That's how and that so works. You're, yep. So you're here. <laughs> we'll jump back into the small town stuff. Um, but how did you find Jesus? That's one of the questions we ask all of our guests because it's it's uh, just fun, but it's also encouraging to hear yeah. people's stories of how God is at work and, uh, you know, how other people were instrumental in you finding Jesus. So tell us uh, your story. So uh, mine is a relatively vanilla, if you will, story. It just, uh, my mom took me to church. She loves Jesus and, and has uh, her whole life. And so I grew up going to church with her. And at four years old, uh, I responded to a, uh, a, a question of, do you want to follow Jesus? And so I, I did at four. And, uh, you know, at, at that age, you don't really know all the implications. I guess even at 42, I don't know all the implications of what that is. But, uh, but that began my journey. And uh, throughout my life, uh, I, I just sought to to learn more about him and allow him to to take over more of my life and and uh, tries my my best to to become more like him. And that's a moment you remember at four. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's I think that's helpful for a lot of folks listening in, where they would have maybe a similar story where family members, parents, somebody in their their life introduce them to Christ early on, um, and but it's still really real. Absolutely. You know, and we have this tension and this struggle of like, but I don't have Craig's story of, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll before right. Jesus. And so somehow the life change that happened in my life is maybe less than because we don't exactly. have this uh, really dramatic before and after. Um, so how do you help people with that as you're pastoring people, as you're helping people? Because you, you probably made a lot of more decisions along the way. Oh, you know, for sure. Pivotal points of, yeah. like you said, figuring out what it means to follow Christ. But how do you help people with, you know, a similar story going, hey, no, it's still like what Christ did in you and is doing in you is just as valid uh, as someone else's story. Well, I think, uh, A, that's a great question. Uh, B, I, I think that what it comes down to is we've all got our own stories. And so when it comes down to it, God uses different experiences. He, he reaches us at different ages. And whether your story is a, a, a dramatic Paul at Damascus story that, that radically transforms you in an instant, or whether it's something that happens 
over time where uh, you really, Jesus begins to shed his light in your life and, and you begin to open up to him more and more. And it may be quote unquote less exciting in a, in a story form, but really when it comes down to it, the gift of Jesus and, and seeing his hope and, and uh, understanding the salvation that he brings, like that, that's the greatest miracle that there is. Uh, no matter what your story looks like. And so I think it's helping people to realize, hey, where, wherever you're at, whatever Jesus has done uh, in you, however long it took, however dramatic or, or not dramatic you might think that it is, the, the miracle is that he's done a work in your life and taken your dead spirit and resurrected it so that you can understand the way the creator made um, this earth and, and what life is really about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And whether it happens at four or 40 or exactly. 82, it's still, it's still more about what Jesus has done than yes. who we are in our story. And Jesus made that point with his disciples. Remember when he had sent them out and they experienced the miraculous. I mean, there was supernatural stuff happening and they came back all excited, like people are getting healed and we even had authority over Satan. We're casting demons out of people. And Jesus said, yeah, don't, don't marvel at that. Yes. Don't, don't revel in that. Here's the thing to revel in. Revel in the fact that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the biggest supernatural, miraculous thing to revel in. That's a yeah. great point. Yeah. That, that our names are registered in heaven. Yeah. You know, uh, Elevation Worship, they came out with a song. Like those, a those song. lines are in there. And you're like, yep. oh, no, that's Jesus talking. Yeah, yeah, it is. That the miracle that I'm still marvel, marveling over is that my name is registered in heaven, that I have eternity in my heart today, and I get to be with Christ forever. And that's the miracle. Because I have a similar story where early on, I remember being three years old and responding to the call of Christ in my life and having um, that be a real thing. And then yeah. as we're growing and maturing as physical people, but also as spiritual people, you know, making decisions in junior high and high school, and am I going to continue to choose Christ? First year at Northwest, right? Like for me, the first six months or so, we're like, dude, this is party, and I can just yeah. do whatever. I felt like extended summer camp. Yep. And I had to wrestle many times, like, am I, as an, as an adult, as a man, going to continue to choose to follow Christ, or is this is just something my parents did, and it was their right. faith, and having to choose and be intentional with what I'm doing, you know, and, and you would think it would be super easy at a Christian-orientated university. <laughs> it, sometimes it was more difficult. Yeah. To, yeah. for me to, to go, no, I'm going to choose to follow Christ. I'm going to yep. serve other people. I'm going to be intentional with that. And it was a couple year journey on that. Well, because it's easy to coast, right? Oh. Depending on the environment that you're yeah. in, it can be really easy to just, you know, live in the emotion of what others are experiencing. And when it comes down to our experience with Jesus, we've got to have that, that individual, personal connection with him, that that's what sustains us. Uh, not necessarily uh, just being in a group and, and experiencing what everyone else is experiencing. Yeah, yeah. You can't you can't follow Christ by association, right? Like, oh, because they're doing it, or I'm sitting yes. here and kind of connected. Um, that it's a, that's not how it works. God's exactly. looking for hungry people. He's looking for like, no, who do you say I am, people? Yep. And like, well, my wife says. Well, that's not the question. Like, but who do you say I am? Yeah. Um, that's that's how that works. Yeah, for sure, it, it, there's a transition there. In both your cases and both your stories, transition from your parents' example yeah. to you owning your own faith. Somebody years ago coined the phrase or, or the saying, God doesn't have any grandchildren to kind of get at that. That's good, yeah. Yeah, he's just got kids, right? And so we're not, we're not the kids of kids. You know, we're not riding anybody else's coattails. We either have our own faith or we don't. Yeah. Yep. Another question, what's something for you over the years that has just been an emphasis for you following Jesus and therefore you're, as you're helping people, what yeah. it means to follow Jesus? Like what's something that is kind of more highlighted for you when it comes to following Jesus? So we've kind of already hit on it and we can drill down further depending on how much you want to do that. But I think really when it comes down to it, it's just simply keeping the main thing the main thing. It seems like in church we can, uh, or e- e- even in the Christian world or culture or American Christianity, uh, we can get distracted and, or focused or on, on other things. And really when it comes down to it, it's the heart of the gospel that, that really needs to be our foundation. And 
uh, if we allow ourselves to get drawn off into other things, then uh, then it not only gets us in trouble, but it, it can it can create uh, and uh, people see that, and it can uh, it can turn them off to what really should be the heart of of the way that we live. You you told me that um, last week you started talking about the Book of Galatians. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, that's, that's ultimately in Galatians 1, what the Apostle Paul is calling the church in Galatia 2, or the churches in Galatia. He's saying, listen, you guys, there's some people out there preaching things with wrong motives. And they're, they're out there, they're the Judaizers, they're wanting you to, you know, to focus on circumcision. And, and really, when it comes down to it, we got to focus on the heart of the gospel, Jesus changing our lives, resurrecting us. And if we can stay focused on that, mm-hmm. then that is, uh, well, let me just say it this way. I think really often we underestimate the power of the gospel. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, because it's the power of God at, at work in our lives to yes. change our lives. And like you said, in Galatians 1, uh, verse 6, Paul is astonished. He goes, I'm astonished that you guys are so quickly deserting the one called, the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is... Re- which, Which is, is really not a gospel. no gospel at all. Right. Yeah. And yep. like, like you're saying, wait, wait why, why are we getting off track on the good news that is the power of God to change your lives? Why are we so f- get focused on the color of the carpet? Yep. Or the format structure of a small group? Or the style of music? The style of music? Yep. Or the attire of people that are either presenting or participating in some sort of quote church gathering, right? Yep. And you're like, wait, what are we focused in on? Is this why are we deserting the good news in in transferring like the power of Christ to some sort of human argument or human effort thing? And God's like, get back on track. Exactly. It's it's to love God, to love others in the power of the Holy Spirit. Like yeah. that's it. That's the clarity of what it means to follow Jesus. And it's so so clear that it seems like we need to complicate it and make it more complex and therefore it gets off track. Well, we're really good at doing that, right? So like making up our own stuff. Well, especially in in America, like we are the most educated culture in history. And we love to learn. We love education. The problem with education, Paul says it great in Corinthians. He said, uh, uh, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And and so as great as it is that, and I love education, I'm all about learning more and, and all of that, but we need to remember, sometimes I think people, they get bored with the message of the gospel, and it's because it's, it's stayed up in their head instead of translating down into their heart and, and, and realizing the depth of the power of transformation that that can happen, not just in a conversion salvation sense, but in a big word, sanctification, you know, living out and becoming more like Christ the rest of my life since. And, um, and all too, and then when we do that, it plays into other areas of our lives that we don't even realize that we've ignored the, the power of the gospel. And so we miss out on, on certain things. We miss out on certain promises in scripture because we've allowed the knowledge to puff us up instead of, lo- instead of Christ's love, build us up or build the church up. And so, um, so I, I think that's a trap, a, a cultural trap that we can easily get in that we need to fight beyond to, uh, to, to really uh, allow the transformational power of the gospel to, to, to continue to work deeper and deeper inside us. That's well said, Paul. And I, um, I was thinking about our culture as you were sharing what you did. Um, in our culture, there is a, an appetite for for knowledge and, and uh, learning in a way that plays to people's ego. Yes. There, there's an arrogance. It's like, yeah, the gospel, that's simple. That's great for you folks. But, you know, I'm more sophisticated than that. I'm more intelligent than that. Yes. I'm more learned than that. And I'm not so foolish as to believe something so simple and childish as the gospel of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, that arrogance, that, you know, that ego, that puffed upness that knowledge brings... Um, that, that gets in the way of the gospel and gets in the way of a relationship. And people, in many cases, fall away from their relationship with yeah. Christ because of it. 
Yeah. That's yeah, unfortunate. It, it really is. Yeah. Because we've made this artificial distinction between like hearing something and then applying it to our lives. Mm-hmm. Like, we think that's two parts in life. Like, oh, I heard something, but I didn't do anything with it. Where, where that's kind of a newer thing, a Greek philosophy thing, where Jesus is, is saying that to people. Like, hey, if you have ears, like, listen. Yeah. Like, well, were people deaf? Were they not hearing? No. It was, he's saying, you're missing the application part, the actual transformation of God in your life that you're trying to separate it, and it's, that's just not how life works. And so we do have this information age, Google at our fingertips. Yes. Before we were like on air, I was joking but serious about like, how do I find things in the Bible? I Google it. I type <laughs> right. Bible, Paul, like loving, you know, not taking grace, sin, and I just type like a phrase or yeah. whatever. And it pops up. It's like, whoop, there's a verse reference that I didn't memorize in college, you know, that I – paid thousands of dollars for it. <laughs> <laughs> but we have this information, but God's looking for transformation. And that's what we are looking for is, is the, our lives to be changed and yeah. our lives to be different. And so just, just like, oh, I know about that. That's, we're, not, we're not looking for just knowing about honest, if we're honest with ourselves. And God's not looking for just know about me. There's this mysterious kind of thing, but not really mysterious. We're at the end of time, Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. We didn't yeah. know each other. And, mm. and uh, balls in our court on that one, where yeah. do we really want to be known by God? You know, I'm going to open up my heart, open up my life and to be known by him takes, takes action on my part, takes a vulnerability, a transparency yeah. to be known by him. He, he knows me. He knows my thoughts. He knows my prayers before I even ask them. He knows the, the number of hairs on my head. Um, but do I want to be known by him personally? You, I mean, you make that's a, my choice. You make a really good point, Scott. And you're referencing a, a passage that for me has been just powerful over the years, especially as a leader and a pastor and a teacher of others. The thing that just unsettles me, just unglues me sometimes when I think about it is people that I had opportunity to influence, people that I taught, people that were in my church or whatever, uh, over the years, I, I just shudder at the thought that they would stand before Jesus someday, and then Jesus would say, "Depart from me, I never knew you." Mm-hmm. Um, just unthinkable, unacceptable, unimaginable to me. Yeah. Um, but the the other part of that that you also referenced is it's not Jesus saying you never knew me, which is also true. But but the focus in in when he says that is I never knew you. That's a good point. You know, we, we often talk about, well, do you know Jesus? How well do you know him? I want to get to know him better. Those kinds of things. Yeah, how well does he know me? Well, well, he knows everything, so he knows me fully. Yeah, but, and you were getting at it, did, are we letting him actually have access to our life? Sure, he knows everything about us, but, but that relational dynamic is yeah. another story. Right, we're inviting him in. Does he not know what's going on? Sure he does. He's God. He of knows course. everything. But is there an interpersonal relationship dynamic where I'm going, God, Here's my heart. Search me. Yeah. Like show me my life. Uh, I surrender my life, my will to you today. So, yeah, it's a powerful thing. And, and um, you're in a context now uh, with Elmira mm-hmm. and Grand Cooley mm-hmm. where you're helping people to follow Jesus, to understand this, this grace of God and the, keeping the main thing the main thing. Um, so I'm curious on that. You've been there for 14 years now. Yeah. Um, and you grew up in Belfair, right? Belfair, Washington, baby. Shout out to small towns, That's USA. Right. That's How right. big is Belfair? Yeah, where is Belfair? Where is Belfair? So Belfair is over on, on uh, the west side of the state. The Kitsap Peninsula. Yes, Kitsap Peninsula over oh, wow. kind of Bremerton-ish area. Sure. A lot of people, oh, Bremerton. Yeah, yeah. Bremerton. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's that's how I reference it. But it's like 40, 30 minutes outside of Bremerton. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, just north of Bremerton. It, like there's the Kitsap Peninsula and then Belfair's in Mason County. Uh, and Belfair, like, of the whole area is kind of considered the redheaded stepchild of the area. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just that. Well, you're redheaded, so yeah, that kind of works so out. So I fit in well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> is that saying even politically correct? No, it's not. It, it's today. not. So I apologize. <laughs> That's right. But when you're from Belfair, like, you don't care what's politically correct. Right. So it's just how you're raised. There, there you are. Which you... <laughs> We'll stop there. No, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> We're equal offenders on this podcast. Okay, we fair just enough. offend everybody. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. Good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's how that goes. So you how big's Belfair? Are you like small town? Oh boy, I, I don't even know. Now it's it's such a different town now than yeah. it was when I when I was growing up. It was probably six, eight thousand. Uh, it with with all the little suburbs of Belfair uh-huh. around it. Um, probably about that when I was there. Yeah. 
and she's kind of a small town guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, when when the town's only six or eight thousand, are the outlying areas actually suburbs? I, I, that's how sure. that, yeah. <laughs> we just consider like when when you're from whether you lived in Allen or Tahuya. I mean, you got to love some of the names. Tunerville, those are that's always great. Tunerville. Great view, yeah. All those you <laughs> just like view. say you're, you're from Belfair. <laughs> You'd think I was making that up, but look it up on the map and you'll yeah. find out. Like those Todd are Stop legit Bell, places. Great view. He lives in Great View. He wouldn't say Belfair. He would say Great View. Oh, would he? I don't know. Oh, see, that's well. He's. I love Todd. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We're getting on some tangents. Small we town are. USA geography. You yeah. gotta love it. People are like Googling it now. Do it. Like it's like Starbucks, Washington, right? People are like that's oh, made up. You hear other names. You you would sure think that was, but I've so, driven through there. So Paul and I were friends of college in apparently <laughs> across the hall. <laughs> Real for good a, Scott. For like <laughs> ten months of my life. Yeah. No, I do remember that. There's, Obviously made a huge impact on your life. So it's that a was long good. time ago. <laughs> well, anyways, we've stayed in touch. He's always been in, in youth ministry and yeah. church and pastoral stuff. Um, but then the craziest thing was uh let's see 2016, so five years ago. <laughs> yes. Amy and I, my wife Amy. Uh, getting into triathlon, we've been doing a few races. Uh, been racing for a few years. Uh, Ironman Coeur d'Alene started to offer the seventy point three distance, which is half the distance of a an Ironman. And so it was the first year in twenty five hundred people. No, it was like thirty thirty two hundred people. It was yeah. sold out that year. It was full. And you rack your bike with your age group. So all the males thirty five to thirty nine were racking our bikes, and I'm on the the rack and I'm put laying out my gear and get everything situated and I look down the row and there's a six foot six tall redheaded dude and it's early in the morning you're getting stuff figured out and I'm double ch triple checking I'm like <laughs> is that Paul MacArthur what is happening so I walk down I'm like Paul what are you doing he's like I'm racing I'm like are you kidding me <laughs> it was it was shocking to say the least and then it was shocking for me to even be there. Be there, right? I, and I was like, I am not a try guy. No, you're not a try guy. No, and you're like, uh, I started training like three days ago. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't three days. No, but, but it was more like three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, it was and close. It was close. <laughs> uh, and so we're racking our bikes together, doing Ironman Coeur d'Alene seventy point three, and uh, you finished. You did it. That I was did. Your goal. I, I barely like, made it, but yeah, I finished. You finished, and but it was shocking. And now, well, you decided that wasn't enough. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm uh, I'm signed up for the full here, uh, June 27th. So uh, never. We are six weeks out. Oh. And how many triathlons have you done since 2016 and now in 2021? So zero in between okay, the two. Okay, zero in between. Yeah. <laughs> zero races, zero marathons, zero any of that. So we're just it's all or nothing for me. And right. so you why not a give it a, a whirl? And uh, so yeah, we're <laughs> we're going for it. Hopefully, you've got more than just three weeks worth of training behind I, you. I'm preparing a little bit more this time. So six weeks. Yeah, six weeks is yeah because it's double the it's distance. Double, so you, you got to give it double the time. No, you've been working hard for months now. You and surprisingly I've been trying, yeah. to me, you've got like in the town of Elmira, you've got some like quality people. We really do. You up. Yeah. Like super good cyclists. Yep. Like a uh, high level swimmer. Yep. Right. Yep. What high level swimmer. Uh, high level Better. cyclists. Uh, we actually got a guy. He, he goes to our church. Um, he is. He's doing it as well. He's he's sixty. Uh, he's sixty two or sixty four years old, and this is his first full. Wow! So um, isn't that awesome? I'm excited for him. Yeah. In the small community, I love triathlon because it's just community. There's yeah. So it, trying to help you out. So I got you uh -oh. a gift today. What? Uh, yeah, for being on the podcast, Dude. but also want to help you out because if you're training for. An Ironman, which includes a full marathon at the end, your sock game better be like high level. You know what's funny about this? So I didn't know where your sock game was. No, my sock game is nowhere right now. Okay. I was actually looking up this exact pair. I'm not making this up. Like two nights it's, ago. Sounds good on the I podcast. Almost, I know it does, doesn't it? I almost ordered them online. Then I'm like, nah, I'm going to Spokane on Wednesday. I'll go to Fleet Feet and pick up a pair. But you already did that for me. I got you. I got you up pair. Thank you. You're welcome, man. That's the you got to have that high level yeah. sock game going. I realized that on my run on Monday, I, my feet were burning, and I'm like, dude, th some things have to change here. Yeah. So you don't yeah. want your whole day to explode because you got tiny little blister on one little pinky yeah. toe, which can like just be painful and crippling, and so 
There Dude, you go. Dude, thank you very much. Get your sock game on. Get, yeah, I will. Get yourself a few more pairs. I'm going to enjoy that. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're not cheap, but they're worth it. Yeah. They are worth it. Every penny. I've been running those for the last couple of years. Have I you? I love it. Yeah. Sweet. So I bought myself some too. Dude. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. It's super good. So you're doing the the full, I'll be out there cheering, not doing it this year, but out there cheering for you and everybody else. It's, it's a fun adventure to f- go across the finish line. So back to small town. Okay, small town. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, let's talk about it. It's always community. fun. got this amazing community. And so you even referenced earlier, maybe somebody caught it, you got the Elmira campus. Yes. So let's talk about that, what you're doing, Elmira, Grand Coulee, some of the opportunities that God's put uh, in front of you in Grand Coulee and who you're reaching and how you're reaching them. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's fun and encouraging um, to help maybe some of our listeners, myself included, break out of our current mold of like, how do we reach people with this good news of Jesus you know, the clear message of the gospel. Yeah. So uh, about five years ago, uh, five and a half years ago, uh, church closed down in Cooley Dam. And, um, and it's just a beautiful, it's like a historic building in that town. And so anyways, uh, got a hold of the de- denomination to see what they were going to do with it. And they didn't know. And they asked if there was anything that we wanted to do with it. <laughs> like, li- like literally turn it around on me. And I'm like, well, and so I kind of just explained to them some thoughts, and they, uh, over the course of a few months, our leadership team was meeting with their leadership team, and uh, they ended up gifting us the building, and so in October of 2016, uh, we started having services down there, and we planted a campus down in Cooley Dam, and that has just been a lot of fun. It's been a, a whole... It, it, it's amazing how different the two campuses are. I didn't realize that going into it. Um, just a, a little bit of distance in between the two uh, is a, a lot of change. Just the but cultural difference. Cultural differences. The towns, yes. Is what you're well, Elmira oh, yeah. is very much a farming town. Yes. And Grand Coulee, not so much. I learned that when yes. we were in Wilbur. Wilbur, another farm community for sure. And then we planted a church. You did s- the years similar ago thing, in Grand yeah. Coulee. And I realized real quick, it's different culture down there, and it's just thirty minutes away. Yep, it yep. really is. Yeah, it's it's not farmers as much as it is, you know, federal Grand Coulee Dam employees, and then also the tribe as well, and right. so and then small business owners as well. But yeah, it's it's a completely different mindset. They both handled COVID much differently than each other, and so it, it's been an interesting journey uh, with all that. Wow, and. So, um, so the last five years been doing both campuses Yes. and, uh, tell stories about like doing stuff in the bar. I think that's fun. I think people will be like, Hey, what? Yeah. I think that's just such a Jesus thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, what also is a Jesus thing when a, when a church building is like shut down and they don't want to just sell it for profit, but they're (laughs) like, Hey, let's continue to use it for the kingdom. And the kingdom is greater than any little subcategory we've created. I always applaud that. I'm like, that's the kingdom of God right there. It, it absolutely is. And that, that was their exact heart. I, I mean, it was a, an amazing experience to work with, with that team of people and, and also extremely humbling for them to, to trust us with that. So, uh, so yeah, so a couple years ago, well, okay. So a couple years ago, um, well, let me, let me back up for a second. So I said earlier, I grew up going to church. My mom took me. My dad was, was never a Christian. So they, they, they remained married. Uh, my dad passed away just about a year ago. Uh, so uh, he, he was not a church guy at all. So uh, he, was, uh, he, he loved his beer and he loved, he loved going to the bar. And um, so I grew up going to church, but also, you know, kind of one foot in, one foot out as far as, you know, my parents go. And, uh, and anyways, I, I didn't realize over the, the course of time, uh, how much that would affect me. And what I mean by that is, uh, not necessarily the, the alcoholism part that yes, that did affect me, but that's a different story. But, but now, you know, 20 years removed from college, 20 years of being in full-time ministry, uh, and, I've always kind of felt like, ah, as, as far as church goes, I, I love the church. I, I love what Jesus has instituted with it. But I, I don't know that I've always felt like I fit per se, even though I've been doing full-time ministry for 20 years. And uh, so I found myself 
uh, kind of going and, and hanging out in uh, some moonlighting, if you will, so at some bars in Spokane, and uh, not not knowing what the church would do, but I I. Uh, my church would think about it. So that's why I'd be going to smoke Spokane because, you know, small town talking, all that stuff. How, how many bars are in Elmira? Uh, zero. Okay. Yes, zero. Elmira has n- nothing right now uh, except a gas station. Gotcha. So, yeah. Okay. Um, but so we might be getting a brewery in a few months. To Spokane bars. What do you, I mean, just coming to hang out. Yeah, coming to hang out. And, and have a drink. Um, or no and, drink. What? Have come in to have a beer or just hang out? Or? Yeah, I'd, I'd go and have a beer. Yeah. And I'd, I'd literally uh, like study for my messages or whatever. And just, and then I would pray every time I'd go in, like, God, is there something that, that you'd want to happen here? And uh, I remember uh, I, was, I was on a bar uh, at a bar in North Spokane uh, preparing for a message. And um, all of a sudden, uh, this guy comes up to me, starts talking to me. And, uh, he asked me what I, I do. I tell him I'm a pastor and he's like, you know, blown away. And so, uh, that began this journey. H- him and I hung out for three hours that day. He went around, he was a local at the bar there. He ran around, he's introducing me to all these different people. And I'm sharing with like, they're asking me like, what in the world is a pastor doing here? I start talking to him about the love of Jesus. And they're, they're like, it, it was an absolutely amazing experience. And he's since moved away. He, he lives over in the Midwest now, but we've remained connected and continue to talk. And uh, it was after that experience, I'm like, okay, God, what are you doing here? And so, um, so I, um, I started doing that a little bit more and, and had other experiences. And, um, and so I'm like, okay, God, you have something going on here. What if we, or what if I just did a service at a bar, at a local bar, and, uh, and just shared the gospel with people? And uh, I didn't know if my leadership team would be on board with that or not. And so, yeah, how'd that conversation go down? It, like, hey, it was I got a new idea. It was a long conversation because okay. we have some that were f- like, "Yeah, that's awesome," and then we have others that are are much more conservative in their approach. Totally get it, and 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 understand why because of of some of their backgrounds. And so, um, uh, we had a long talk about it. We prayed about it. Uh, they they took a month to to kind of pray things through. And uh, we met again and, and talked about it again, and they finally gave me the go-ahead to uh, make it happen. And so Easter of 2018, we had our first service at, at a local bar there called the, the High Dam Bar and Grill. And uh, it that was, was in Grand Coulee area. In Grand Coulee, yeah. And, uh, and then we started so doing So what it. does that look like, though? When you say you had a, a gathering at a bar. yeah. Like, I don't I have no idea what other people are picturing. <laughs> <laughs> Did the like, ushers come down and yeah, take an offer? Yeah. yeah. No, what, what, what is that like? Like, when you say that, what, what it's so break it's, that down for it's, us. it's pretty, pretty free form. So, uh, completely relationally based. Uh, so started out cause didn't really know what to do except. So would just play, pick out some, some songs, uh, that that mentioned Jesus and and things like that 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 they might recognize would have that going. I'd go around and, and meet and talk with people, and we had signs up, and so people knew like if they were coming in that that there was going to be something was going on. Different here. live music tonight. And, yes, than I'm, the normal. I'm interested in the bar owner's take on this. Like, I'll give you that in a second. Because yeah. so when I had a connection with the manager there. Uh, I had done his wedding. And so I'm like, dude, what would you think about this? And he's like, dude, let's give it a try. And so we did. And the bar owner showed up that night. I had never met him before. I didn't know where he was at. I didn't know what, you know. And um, Did he show up to like check it out? Oh, or yeah. He just, okay. No, no, he showed up. He wanted to see what was going on. And so he he sat on the back table. And and uh, and then I just gave like a, a 10, 15 minute message and uh, went around and started talking with people. I was praying for people in, in the bar and stuff, and, um, and then uh, went over and, and introduced myself to him, and uh, he, he says to me, uh, when are we doing this again? I'm like, uh, you know, I would love to do this again, and so we scheduled another one, did another one, scheduled another one, did another one, and, um, and then through that, um, got 
got a hold of a local band and they're Christians. They, they play all over. And so uh, got them to come in and do some live music. And we started doing this kind of on a, on a more regular basis. And the bar owner would show up every time. And, and is he a Jesus follower? Well, uh, so he, n- not yet. So he, he would say to me, he'd say, um, Paul, can you talk longer? Now, you guys know as preachers, <laughs> no one ever says that to you, right? No, like, right. it's always like, okay, come on, hurry it up. Let's wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, come on, let's get the... Guy and, in the and, fourth row is sleeping, you're like, I should probably wrap it up. Yeah, he's literally saying to me, you, you know, uh, go longer. Share with us more. And I, you know, one time I shared uh, about Jesus being in the... Um, in the boat and, uh, or excuse me, not in the boat, but walking on the water and, uh, you know, Simon Peter going out and, and stepping out of the water. And, and I mean, he was, he was zeroed in glued in and, uh, I've had some great conversations with him. He's not quite there yet as far as faith goes, but, uh, you know, since COVID hit, we haven't met and, uh, I've gotten several, um, texts from him, uh, him and his new manager, like, Hey, when are we going to get this rolling again? And so it's been a really neat, uh, uh, thing I've been able to walk through uh, with some of the people that would come regularly. They've gone through, through some some pretty tough stuff just with life, and uh, so been able to walk through some of that with them and try to be a, a positive influence and, and kind of point them, steer them uh, instead of going down a road of destruction, steer them in a direction that that could lead them towards life. So it's been it's been quite the journey. Yeah, that's super fun, and I I just think that's encouraging for all of us to hear is like. Just what do we have right before us, you know, and it just started with this, correct, correct me if I'm wrong here on this, but it seems like in your story, if I'm connecting some of the dots, that maybe you were consciously and maybe even just God was directing you kind of subconsciously, like to go to the bar and to preach the good news because of the story of your dad and, you know, the desire for your dad to have heard the gospel at a bar. Absolutely. For someone to be there and say, hey, I wish, I wish someone would be where my dad was and share the good news of Jesus with him in this kind of context, and maybe he would be more open to receive it, you know? And that's what Jesus did. Yeah. He got all, all sorts of flack hanging out with, the, quote, the wrong people, being at the wrong places. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, I'm here to help the people that are, like, in need. And, and the flack that he got was not from those people. No, It was right. from the religious establishment. Yeah. From Again, the Jews. Yeah, this, they, yeah. they were the ones that were critical. And in our modern-day culture, it's going to be the Christians that yeah. are going to be critical of somebody doing what you're doing. Yeah. And not, not the people that are at the bar. They, they love it. Yeah. They talk longer, right? They, yeah. They have a whole different take on it. Because it's the path of life, and we're all looking for that. And I just think it's cool because it was every day for you. It's yeah. just like, hey, I got to prep for a message somewhere. Yeah. And why not use this opportunity We're real intentionally to like be on the lookout for how God yeah. would use me and connect with people. And for all of us, you're like, uh, life's just kind of mundane, everyday life. Like, I'm just going to work or I'm just going to drop the kids off at school and pick them up or uh, we're just doing this social thing like there's way more to be tapped into what we're already currently doing exactly versus waiting for this thing over here called ministry or a missions trip or some sort of like big event that God's going to use us at where it's God's going oh no you just you just talk to the checkout person yes that, in, that's, in that moment. that's the thing about this. So like when I started doing this, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go to the bar and hang out and drink some beer. You know, that wasn't it. Right. It was an understanding that it, it, because of what, what I saw, you know, the experience that I had growing up, it was an understanding that, hey, now the church is all about creating community. Well, what, what's the bar do too? Yeah. I was going to make that point earlier. That's exactly why peop- some people are drawn to those environments. I mean, it's like the TV show Cheers, you know, a place where everybody, everybody knows your name. Exactly. The, the, guy, name. the guy that you were talking about earlier, he went around and introduced yes. you to all the people because they know each other. Yep. There's a sense of acceptance, belonging. Now, of course, there's other stuff going on. They're self-medicating or exactly. escaping from their troubles. But, but that need for community is yeah. a, Be in a the mug club. I want to be in the mug club, Yeah, it's man. the same dynamic yeah. with a gang. Yep. You know, it's a place to belong. It's a place where people know me and I can be known and I'm accepted for who I am. So that was the that was the conscious decision on my part. Instead of going to a restaurant where everyone kind of has their own table and you're you're with your group, your family or whatever, it was like, "Hey, if I'm going to be here by myself, then I'll I'll take this time to study." But 
this this will present more opportunities to to create relationship and conversation with people and and maybe be able to share with them the good news of Jesus. And so that was my mindset going into all of it. And it kind of just morphed from there. And uh, like you said um, earlier, Scott, it, it definitely... The, there, it, I began to see the, the motivation. I don't know that I saw it initially, but I had an experience uh, in Belfair at, at like the longstanding bar there that, that helped me to realize that, yeah, I, I do wish that, you know, part of me doing this is, wish, is hoping that, that maybe I could be to someone uh, what I, I wish someone would have been to my dad. And uh, I, had a, I had a Jesus moment. I don't know if we have time to go into it. Maybe, we, maybe that's for a different time. But uh, I had a Jesus moment there, and that, that's what really shaped. What's the, what's the story on that? So, so th- my dad would go into this bar every night. That's what he would do. And, um, and so anyways, uh, I had never been in, in it before. I'd been going to different places around here. And I remember I was, I was home visiting my parents. This was a couple years ago. And I drove by, and I'm like, I should, I should go into the woodshed tonight. And, uh, and I went and got some stuff and then was heading back to my parents' house. And I'm like, I should go into the woodshed tonight. And I'm like, no. And I had some, to be honest with you, some hard feelings towards that place because that was the place that took my dad. And... Um, and so I drove past it again. I'm like, nope, I'm going in. So I, I turned around, pulled in the parking lot, and I realized that I, I, I don't even know if I had known it, but, but I, had been, I had had some really just deep inner turmoil about this place. And so I said, okay, God, uh, I'm going to go in here if for nothing else than to, to just break the cycle of feelings that I have. And so, Lord, if you have something that you want to do uh, tonight, uh, then I, I give this time to you. So I walk in there and uh, walk through the doors and, and sit down. And uh, immediately this gal is like, hey, what are you doing? You know, and I'm like, oh, new guy, you know, basically kind of thing. And I'm not a small guy. And so when there's only like two or three people <laughs> in there, you, you know, <laughs> yeah, you kind of stand out. And so start talking and all this stuff and, and uh, uh, order some food and, um and then they asked me what I do, and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm a pastor. And they're like, what? You know, it's the same response right. every time. Like, what in the world are you doing here then? So then she leaves, and, and I'm eating my food, and this guy comes over to me, and he says, are you really a pastor? And I said, yeah. And, uh, and so he starts asking me some questions about the Bible and about um, just about life in general, and then he makes the statement that's really f- fairly common uh, a, a, a fairly common belief in our culture. And this is after probably about 20, 30 minutes of, of going back and forth and talking and all this stuff. And he says, you know, when it comes to, and I've done mostly listening at this point, right? Uh, he says, really, when it comes down to it, uh, I believe that I have a good heart and God knows that. And so by this time, as, as we're talking about this, the gal had come back over and she was sitting on the other side. So I'm, I'm sandwiched in between these two people sitting up at the bar there. And, uh, I just simply said to him, uh, yes, God does know your heart, but that doesn't necessarily mean your heart is good. And he, he looks at me and he's like, well, what do you mean by that? I said, I, I know, I'm, I don't doubt your intentions, but he was just talking about how broken the world is. And I say, we, you see brokenness all over the world, but you have to see it in your own life. And he's like, yeah, I do. And I said, that, that is the problem with sin is it creates that brokenness in us and we've all got it. And it's, it's Jesus is the only one that can, can take that brokenness and, and make it whole again. And, um, and so I say that to him and then the gal who had definitely had too many to drink, she said, how dare you say that to him? He, I've known him longer than you'll ever know him. He has a good heart. I'm like, oh boy, what do I say now, you know? Exactly. And he says to her, no, Paul's right. My heart isn't as good as I want to believe it is. I'm like, good answer. oh Jesus, here we go. <laughs> so I literally, I have, and, and so she was mad at me. He, cal- he kind of calmed her down. She walked off again. 
And, uh, and then him and I uh, connect again, and, or not connect again, but we just keep talking and just talk through the, um, uh, through the gospel, through uh, you know, Jesus' saving power and how we can't earn it. And because that's the typical American mindset, I'm going to earn it. And, um, and, and we're naively optimistic about the condition of our heart, unfortunately. Yeah. And that's what keeps us oftentimes from Jesus. So we talked through all that. He ended up, after a couple of beers, he ended up getting his food and, and he was taking it home to, to his wife. And, uh, and he, <laughs> he, uh, he said to me, I, I wanna thank you so much for tonight. I'm never gonna forget it. Uh, this has been a life-changing moment for me. And we, again, we connected through social media and we're still friends and talk uh, on occasion. And uh, it was in that moment when I left that night, I'm like, okay, God, you are, you're, there, you do have something. There, there is something special going on and there is something, you're leading me in this direction. And, um, and, and then it was from there that kind of springboarded with the leadership team. And, and then we started having services at the high down. That was when I decided, you know what? I don't really care what other people think. I'm going to go public. It doesn't matter, you know, whether I'm a pastor, it doesn't matter what kind of small town I live in. God is leading me in this direction. And so I don't want to stay safe within the side, the walls of the church. I want to get outside where he was leading me because that is, uh, that's where the spirit is at work. And I want to join him. I don't want to expect him to go with me wherever I'm comfortable or safe or whatever it might be. That's so powerful. Yeah. And so how did you feel after leaving the woodshed that night as far as the feelings you went in with and dealing with some of that angst and or whatever you're, you know, struggling with there as far as the woodshed took your dad and all that kind of stuff. It was an interesting um it was an interesting thing on on two levels and I don't know how much you want to get into it but uh on the one level complete freedom. When I when I I, I felt like I, the shackles of things that I had kind of held I didn't even realize we're there, uh, was free from those things. Uh, so that was kind of one end. The other end was um, this incredible responsibility. So I went home that night and, uh, and went to bed and woke up at like one in the morning and I couldn't get back to sleep. My heart was stirring. And so I, I got in the car and, and drove all over uh, drove actually out to yes, it's a real place to Huya, and which is on the other side of the Hood Canal, and and uh, I, I sat. It was still dark out. I was sitting just in this dirt road, and just crying and weeping and like, okay, God, are you really leading me in this direction? Are you really wanting to to make this happen? Because there are people that need you, and and they would never set foot in the doors of a church, uh, but but I know that, that your good news is for them. And so it was this incredible moment of like, of responsibility and, and realizing that, uh, that my calling is not just my position within a church, but my calling is a lifestyle and the way that I carry myself and the, the uh, trying to spot the opportunities that, that God brings my way. And, uh, and obviously I'm saying my, 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 my a lot, but, but it, when it comes down to it, that's for us as Christians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as so, your, as your personal journey to follow Jesus, yes. we talked about earlier, just having that mm -hmm. intentionality and hunger in my own heart to follow God and not through association not through my parents' faith or a spouse's faith or just uh, like I go to a church building once in a while, so therefore I'm doing it. Like yeah. God's going, no, like who do you say I am and what are you doing to follow me? Yes. Not Jesus, you follow me, Yeah. but follow him and to love God and to love others in the power of the Holy Spirit wherever, as we are going, make disciples yes. as we are going, yeah. wherever we're going, whatever we're just, doing. Just quickly, you know, one of the things, Paul, that I appreciated about what you've shared here today is that it's really not about, as I listen to your story and listen to your heart, it's not about you being a pastor. You are a pastor. Right. right. Um, but, but what you've done with your life and how you live your life, and, and in particular the story of how God led you into ministry in bars, um, it's, it, that's, that's you following Jesus. This is the Find and Follow podcast. And we're trying to help people follow Jesus. And, 
And that's what you've been doing all these years. He's led you step by step. You've checked in with him each step along the way. Lord, are you leading? Yeah. Is this what I should do? And, and so it's not, hey, this is what pastors should do or, right. or this is what every believer should do. Hey, I've got a new model of evangelism. <laughs> Let's all go hang out in bars. Yeah. That's not your point. Your point exactly. is... Some people just cheered right there like, yeah! <laughs> I think you're cheering yeah. for the wrong reason. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Some of you probably need to go and hang out in bars. God yeah. is leading you the same way he's led Paul here. But yeah. anyway... That's my point is, this is not about you creating a program or you as a pastor. This is about you as a man yes. who loves Jesus and is doing his very best to follow Jesus. And this is how he's led you and how he's using you. And I think yeah. that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And so as you're listening, and I hope you're just encouraged, like you're saying, Craig, what is it that God has for me? And as I am going, the things I'm already doing, um, you know, the, 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 your story, like Paul's story today, just God uses our story good and bad, to yes. bring good out for his kingdom, um, or maybe just something you're passionate about, and it's not part of your story, um, but you just have a heart for something that just keeps coming up, keeps coming up in your heart and your mind. Maybe you find yourself like Paul in his story of like, just I find myself in taking some time on a dirt road and just like, God, what do I do with this? God would say take some action on it. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have, know every step. Just with the motivation of love, to love God, to love others in the power of the Holy Spirit, to take action on those things that God is using you in and um, that you would, you would see God change your life and you would see God use you to minister to other people that we're all changed for a purpose. And the purpose is to help people to find and follow Jesus. Um, so. Paul, thanks for being on the podcast Absolutely. today. We thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, we appreciate your transparency. Fun. I know there's people listening in and um, that are just like blown away by the level of, what, of your story you shared and encouraged by that. Um, if you're out in Coeur d'Alene on June 27th. June 27th, baby. Cheer Paul on with everyone else doing the... Uh, the Iron Man, dude. It's it's. I'll be at the back of the pack. So <laughs> <laughs> he's the uh, six foot six redheaded guy yep. who was uh, smiling, but maybe struggling a bit. Yeah. But really enjoying yep. every step of the journey. Those, Absolutely. Uh, finish line feels are amazing. So you'll yep. be able to feel that in a few weeks here. And don't forget, there's a bonus episode of the Find and Follow podcast coming out, and it actually centered around this idea of being changed by the power of God and awesome. living from a heavenly power, not our human power. Uh, and what that, how to do that real practically. So be on the lookout for that. But thanks for tuning in today, and we'll see you on the next episode. You can help people find and follow Jesus by subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with some friends, and leaving a review so it's easier for others to find it. 